Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Tang. I'm the Heritage Planner at the City of Windsor, and I'm excited to welcome you today to the six o'clock public engagement session for our Windsor Archaeological Management Plan Review. The AMP review project values your participation and interest. And while I'm here as the city's project manager, there's a team of us here who are also hosting this virtual session. So I have with me our archaeological consultants, the lead consultants from uh, Archaeological Services Inc. ASI. We have Robert McDonald, who is the consultant uh, project manager, and uh, Martin Cooper from ASI. And we have a subconsultant lead, Jacqueline Fisher from Fisher Archaeological Consulting. And on the City of Windsor staff, we also have Michael Cook, deputy deputy city planner and manager of planning policy, and Tracy Tang, who is also a plan, planner majorly involved in this project. So for today's program, ASI will provide an overview and presentation of the AMP project for about 20 to 25 minutes. Then we will open the session up for question and answers. So we ask that you direct all of your Q&A type questions to the Q&A button at the far right bottom of your screen instead of the chat box. And you are welcome to type your questions at any point during today's session and upvote any questions posed by others that are of interest to you. We will be going through the Q&A after the presentation. So we are keep keeping your microphones muted until then. And during the Q&A, you can use the raise hand function to let us know if you would like to speak by microphone and that will allow us um, to unmute you. So you can also simply type in your questions into the Q&A without audibly speaking to it and we will address your typed questions. So this public engagement session will wrap up in an hour at seven o'clock and you will receive a post-session survey if you have any interest in sending in um, more of your comments, questions or information to our project team. And we'll also provide the link to our project webpage where you can find the contact information for myself and Robert McDonald. And lastly, as part of the housekeeping items, Please note that this session is being recorded and we will be uploading the recording to our project webpage. So with that said, we will first start with a simple poll of two questions as we would like to see where you're coming from and your various areas of interest. So the first question, which groups or group do you uh, most identify with and you can pick one or more. So um, Indigenous community member, licensed archaeologist, land developer, development industry consultant, uh, whether you're a government um, a staff or from a special interest group or organization, or if you consider yourself as a member of the general public or others. So that's our first question. And I'll give you a couple of about few more seconds to um, respond to the poll. Okay, so um, I think um, you should be able to see the polling results. So we're seeing um, representation from um, most of the groups and um, with the most coming from a special interest group representation. So we have a next question um, for you as well. Um, so yeah, we're seeing that um, most of you have the most interest in archeological sites and archeological assessments and development requirements, indigenous engagement and um, other general cultural heritage areas of interest. So thank you all for participating in a poll and um, now I hand the time over to Robert McDonald, our uh, consultant project manager from ASI for the PowerPoint presentation. Thanks, Christina. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening and to share the work that we're doing to uh, review and update the Windsor Archaeological Management Plan. Um, the city of Windsor uh, was a fairly early adopter of archaeological management plans, which started in the, the 1980s in Ontario. 
but there are many large municipalities that are just undertaking them now. So the fact that we're doing an update for the city of Windsor, uh, more or less 20 years downstream is, is a, a really good indicator of how important uh, Windsor takes their archeological heritage. So this uh, report uh, was, uh, the original report was completed in 2005. And we're delighted to have Jackie Fisher, who was part of the original consulting team, uh, working with us on this project uh, and providing that continuity from the original work. Just a little bit of uh, explanation of what an AMP is and, and why we do archeological management plans in Ontario. So there's a, a whole network of laws that create a framework, a statutory framework for managing and preserving and, and conserving archeological heritage in Ontario. And one of the most important pieces of that is the Ontario Planning Act. Under the Ontario Planning Act, a something called the Provincial Policy Statement, which is, is the document that really articulates the, uh, the, the way that the Planning Act works in Ontario. And this statement is updated from time to time, most recently last year. Uh, and the uh, Provincial Policy Statement uh, makes it clear that uh, archaeological sites uh, are to be uh, looked after as part of the planning process. And so, for example, uh, develop, land development cannot proceed uh, that would involve any kind of site alteration uh, unless uh, those uh, archaeological resources have been uh, in, uh, found and, and uh, dealt with in, in advance. Um, so uh, that's created a, a, an important element of the, the process here. The municipal planners who approve developments uh, are required to, uh, to consider archaeology as part of the process. Um, the PPS also uh, recommends the use of archaeological management plans because these provide municipal planners with the tools that they need to make the decisions about when an archaeological uh, assessment is required. So it's essentially an important part of the triggering process um, it takes all the guesswork out of that decision making for the municipal planners. And then finally, uh, a really important piece of all of this in, under the provincial policy statement is that planning authorities are required to engage with Indigenous communities in uh, undertaking uh, planning work, and that includes archaeological, uh, archaeological management planning, and as well the archaeological consultants have a statutory obligation through provincial licensing to engage with Indigenous communities. So as I mentioned, an archaeological management plan is a tool created for land use planners uh, to help them decide when archaeological assessments are required. And it is a process that involves starting with what you know, uh, in other words, an inventory of known archaeological sites. Um, the, the interesting thing about trying to plan or conserve archaeological sites is unlike things like wetlands and things that you're familiar with that are also managed in the uh, land development process, archaeological sites are invisible for the most part. So it's, it's uh, a difficult pro, uh, challenge to manage for a resource that you can't see unless you actually go and look for them. So one of the ways we do that is to produce a model uh, of potential. In other words, trying to partition the jurisdiction into areas that we believe are more likely to have archaeological potential uh, or the potential for discovering archaeological sites and those that have lower potential. We then use those uh, the existing or known site information to essentially test those models and see how the, the known sites uh, compare to what the expectations are from, from the model. And then the, the a fourth major element of the uh, archaeological management planning process is developing policy. In other words, uh, essentially the procedures that would be followed by planners in carrying out this, uh, this activity. The development of an archaeological management plan uh, is uh, itself, the potential modeling is also a stage or step process. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we start with, uh, uh, with known sites, but we also look at potential based on what we know about how people have used the land over time. And as you can imagine, since we have over 13,000 years of human occupation in Ontario, uh, we have to look at indigenous land use uh, as being potentially very different 
to and changing over time. It hasn't always been the same uh, when compared to, let's say, colonial site uh, land use. So the first step is to create a potential model for indigenous sites, uh, understanding how how they how the land changed, how they adapted to that changing landscape, and and trying to understand it from what we know about indigenous uh, lifeways, how how they likely distributed themselves across the landscape. A similar process is undertaken for colonial colonial sites. Uh, so we look at historical maps, we look at uh, known sites, we, we understand how the particular municipality was developed. How, you know, where were the earliest communities and so on? Where were the, uh, the the various elements of that? The the industrial sites, the commercial locations, the 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 you know the pioneers' log cabins and everything else. So that um, that factors in and then we put those two together we combine the indigenous modeling and the colonial modeling to create uh, a potential layer and then test those against known sites the last step is to evaluate integrity so integrity refers to the fact that uh, over the years there's many things that have occurred on the landscape that would have removed archaeological sites and archaeological potential so you can imagine if you have, a, let's say, an aggregate pit, uh, that excavation for those resources would have completely removed any archaeological sites and other activities of that nature. Any kind of major land disturbance activity may have impacted and removed archaeological integrity. So that piece is sort of clipped out of that uh, layer and, uh, and, and, and uh, becomes an important part of, of the, uh, the process as well. When the first AMP was done for the city of Windsor, uh, finished in 2005, there was a, a grand total of 18 registered archaeological sites in the city. Uh, and one of the reasons that we do updates to AMPs is because that information changes over time. Today, we have 150 registered archaeological sites in the city of Windsor. Um, and, and a lot of that work has been triggered by uh, development activities, um, that have uh, mandated uh, archaeological assessments. This is a pixelated map just showing generally the distribution of sites in the city of Windsor. And for example, you can see kind of a linear thing going on here, which represents a lot of the archaeological sites that were discovered during the uh, Detroit International uh, Detroit River International Crossing project, for example, and other projects have contributed as well to the increase in information about known sites. So that's an important reason why we need to do an update is to basically take advantage of the information that's accumulated over time. Um, another uh, bit of information that accumulates over time is uh, just our understanding of how land, uh, the land has changed and whatnot. And this, this uh, map is illustrating amongst other things, the, the integrity a layer that was created. So things have changed since then, which would have removed in integrity. So we need to update that as well. The, the archeological potential map that was created in 2005 looks like this. And you can see that this map illustrates in green areas of what are considered to be lower archeological potential and areas in yellow that were considered to have higher potential. So the outcome of this project will be to review uh, essentially uh, look at all the information and, and see if we need to change this map and uh, update it accordingly. I mentioned that the uh, important part of the process of potential modeling is understanding how indigenous people have changed or have used the land over time. And this requires what what's called a paleo environmental reconstruction. In other words, we need to know how the landscape has changed and how indigenous people use the land at various points in time. And this is an area that we that continues to evolve and grow as well. And we have some fairly new information, relatively new information that really informs this process. I'm just gonna do a quick run through to just give you an idea of how ra radically, uh, in some cases, the landscape has changed because this might be something that you're not aware of. So for uh, about uh, over 14,000 years ago, as the last ice age was uh, coming to a close, this vast Laurentide ice sheet was withdrawing from southern Ontario. And this is when the first Indigenous people moved into the province. And uh, of course, that environment was very different than today. It's more like 
a far northern sort of uh, a tree line uh, environment uh, that people were living in, and they were doing some some uh, quite different things, as you'll see in a minute. Um, at that time, uh, about when people first arrived here, the Great Lakes looked different than they do today. I'll just go back here. You can see that Lake Huron, for example, was larger. It's what we call Lake Algonquin. It was a bigger lake, uh, but uh, Lake Lake Erie, oops, Lake Erie also was at a higher elevation and this is a fair this is fairly new information you can see this is from an article that was published in 2012 so this level of detail that we now have was not available in 2005 although even then we knew that the lakes went up and down but uh, the resolution our understanding of that has really improved over time so for about a thousand years uh lake erie looked like this and so lake st Clair was bigger than the the uh Detroit River was wider, et cetera. So these are factors that are important for understanding where people may have been situated and how they used the land. Uh, these early folks that were around when there was uh, caribou were common in Southern Ontario, but also uh, animals that are now extinct like mammoth and mastodon that they were hunting. Um, so clearly uh, a different adaptation than what you might imagine uh, at certainly as uh, from what came on later. After about 12,000 years ago, the Great Lakes went into a different phase. It went into a low water phase for about 6,000 years, and they look more like this. So uh, what's interesting about this, to, of course, to Windsor, is the fact that there was no flow out of the Huron Basin into Lake Erie like we have today. So essentially, it was dry land here in the city of Windsor, uh, there may have been some small water courses that followed the the, the, the channel uh, of the Detroit River and the St. Clair River. There were probably wetlands in the St. Clair uh, Lake St. Clair Basin and in the western basin of Lake Erie, uh, but but the river uh, as we know it today was certainly not there. Uh, so again, that would have had tremendous impact on. Uh, indigenous land use patterns. And here's a little closer view of what that may have looked like uh, between about 12,000 and about 6,000 years ago. Again, this level of detail is new and from this article, it came out in 2012. During the early millennia of, uh, in, of indigenous occupation, not only did the lakes go up and down, but the, of course the, the climate continued to change, the land warmed and the forest changed as well. And by about 8,000 years ago, we saw a transition from what had originally been what's called a spruce parkland, sort of an open boreal type forest that you can see up here, to a forest more similar to what we're familiar with today, which is the Northern mixed hardwood forest. Uh, so there's thousands of years during which people were occupying a more Northern type environment. We know that their lifestyles changed uh, uh, over time, in part because the toolkits that they used uh, changed most notably or most obviously in things like different forms of spear points that they used. Here's just an example of some you know, different styles of points. And we, we can use these uh, to help date the sites that we find and, and really get an understanding of where different people are at different times and what they're doing there. Uh, in this first, uh, in this period called, what, that we call the Archaic period, which lasted for thousands of years, uh, people were hunter-gatherers. They were certainly hunting a uh, game uh, by by certainly 11,000 years ago. The mammoth and mastodon were long gone. The caribou had moved north, and so you you had a more familiar variety of prey species like white-tailed deer and wild turkeys and things like that uh, coming in. Fish was a hugely important uh, resource. And so obviously Windsor and its proximity to the Detroit River and Lake St. Clair and, and Lake Erie, uh, fishing was undoubtedly an important resource there as well. But other things is too, here we have some examples of some charred acorns. So we know that they were harvesting nuts from trees uh, and uh, just, you know, as hunter gatherers do, they're very uh, resourceful and, and look to a wide variety of plant and animal foods. Over time, um, the lakes began filling back up. And uh, what's important uh, to uh, understand, or an important aspect of this, is that when people were occupying these lakes when they were at their lower levels, 
Many of their settlements were situated around the shorelines of these lower level lakes. Certainly the, the what we call the macro band or major base camps were situated uh, frequently along these shorelines. Uh, they practice a, a seasonal round so that in the winter they might disperse into the interior to spread out and and uh, into smaller nuclear family hunting territories. But in the warm season, they were typically situated along the lake shores. So a lot of those sites are probably underwater now and we don't have access to that archeological record. Uh, so this is another important thing to keep in mind is the changing lake levels uh, affected the visibility of archeological sites to us today. Um, the high level uh, actually came back uh, around 6,000 years ago. Uh, as the lakes continued to fill up, they filled up past the current, the modern levels and reestablished at a higher elevation for a, a period of time. And then what happened about um, 4,000 years ago is that the sill that was holding Lake Erie up at that higher elevation at Niagara Falls, uh, the water, the erosion of the, of the Niagara River broke through that sill and lowered Lake Erie and the, everything upstream to its modern elevation. Um, so again, changing water levels. About a thousand um, years ago, uh, we had the final period in indigenous culture history, what we call the woodland period. And this uh, saw a dramatic change in the economy of indigenous people with the arrival of maize agriculture. So they were growing what were known as the three sisters, maize, beans, and squash. And this led to the development of more settled uh, communities, uh, longhouse villages, and so on. And again, a change in the land use pattern of indigenous people. So this adaptation uh, also influenced uh, where we find sites and of what time period. So another aspect that we need to take into consideration. Uh, this is just an example showing some of the uh, archaeological sites have been registered in around the, the Windsor area. And as you can see, this was a very rich area, wild rice being an important resource uh, for local indigenous communities, uh, but uh, waterfowl and fish and everything else, just an extremely rich area. So uh, lots of lots of great information to work with uh, here. The I mentioned also that in, in addition to indigenous land use uh, and archeology, span we're interested in colonial uh, settlement as well. And uh, so we, uh, we certainly look at how that was, uh, came about in the Windsor area. Uh, we look at various uh, particular areas of settlement, the, the, the trends, the patterns and so on. And all of that gets incorporated into the modeling we do for the colonial time period. And as I said, all of that gets combined in to produce the zone of archeological potential, uh, finally, that looks like something like this. So that's kind of a quick run through of the, uh, the process of doing, creating AMPs, uh, the stages and the various uh, things that are taken into consideration. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly, uh, complex and sophisticated exercise. The nice thing here is we're doing a uh, review. So uh, uh, we're not starting from scratch. We've got a great document to work with and great research that goes ahead. So it's more or less just taking a look at it and saying, okay, what, what do we know now that we may not have known in 2005 and how can we adjust this and, and make any improvements to it? So to, under, to, to accomplish that, we've put together a a uh, project consulting team uh, with various roles and responsibilities, as you can see here. Um, and it's a, it's a very robust team with expertise in all manner of things, uh, in environmental archeology, span uh, policy and standards and guidelines, uh, historical archeology, span indigenous consultation and engagement, you know, fair, uh, and of course, geomatics uh, or geographical information systems because all of this work is now done using GIS. Uh, and in fact, it was um, certainly uh, part of the process even back in 2005, but now we're, we're much more hands-on with that uh, and 
uh, we certainly got a lot more uh, in terms of environmental data to work with than we did uh, 20 years ago. We have a technical working group um, that has been set up uh, to basically be the, the the group that sort of rolls up their sleeves and, and uh, provides uh, liaison with the consultant team. So we had uh, a variety of folks from the city of Windsor, many of whom are on the uh, with us tonight, including Michael Cook and Christina Tang and Tracy Tang. But we also have representation from the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries who are uh, providing advice on various things. We have a represent the president of the local chapter of the Ontario Archaeological Society, Amanda Black, is part of our technical working group. Uh, and of course, we have uh, the, the leads from our respective consulting companies, Fisher Archaeological Consulting and Archaeological Services, Inc. The project objectives, very quickly, update this, the site's database. As I mentioned, we've gone from 18 to over 150 sites. Uh, review the current archaeological potential model in light of the, the environmental data and whatnot that I, I've gone through this evening. Um, look at the, uh, the legislation. We have a, a new provincial policy statement that just came out last year, for example. So we need to make sure that everything that's addressed in the document is up to date there. Uh, look at implementation. How, how does this uh, work in 2021 compared to how it used to work in 2005 vis-a-vis -vis the, the municipal planning process? Uh, and a, a really important aspect of this is engagement protocol for Indigenous communities. This is something that uh, is uh, really in 2005, uh, in, very serious Indigenous engagement was just starting out as a result of several Supreme Court decisions. Uh, but that has been growing and evolving over the over the intervening years, and now it's extremely robust. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's actually uh, a, re a statutory requirement. So uh, figuring out how that's supposed to work is something we're developing uh, with uh, in concert with the Indigenous communities that we're, we're seeking their advice on how they want to be engaged and then designing a process that uh, that works in that fashion. And then finally, public increasing public awareness is a very important aspect of this project. And this evening is an example of one way that we're doing that. But, uh, uh, you know, this all works best when everybody's part of the process at some level. We've got lots of people uh, out there, eyes and ears on the ground. We can't, archaeologists can't be everywhere, planners can't be everywhere. Uh, and so having an engaged community that really uh, appreciates and understands the importance of archaeology and is uh, involved in that uh, is hugely important in, in this whole exercise. So right now we're, um, it, it looks like we're halfway done, but we're actually not. A lot of this was sort of the setup process here. Uh, the actual work of doing the technical stuff is, is, is really just getting underway to some degree. Uh, a lot of this has been setting up the indigenous and community engagement process, uh, but we're certainly in great shape there. And this will be uh, continuing uh, through to the uh, towards the end of this year. So there's plenty of opportunity for you to participate and, and be involved as we go forward here. Uh, the Windsor, uh, City of Windsor's uh, website, which already had uh, a, a a page devoted to the existing archaeological management plan has been updated and expanded uh, for purposes of this project. So you're welcome to consult that, uh, and you'll you'll find over uh, through through the links, the tabs here on the side, links to the the, the consultation process and the timeline, the steering committee members, and who who's in the uh, technical working group, various documents and notices um, that we'll be posting there, and then finally. Uh, a page that you'll see at the end of this um, presentation, which talks about who to contact for, for more information. So there you go. That's Those are the people right there. Uh, Christina, who you've already met, and myself. We're more than happy to uh, uh, hear from you and find out what, uh, what you can, how you can contribute. Do you have information about archaeological sites you'd like to share um, with us? Or do you have questions about the process? Anything 
you know, anything that's on your mind, uh, we're happy to uh, hear from you on that. Uh, and um, actually right now, I think, uh, I think we can probably open it up to some questions. Thank you. So um, we do have a first question on the question and answer. Um, so the question is, can, can you share a list of contacts to local indigenous communities so we can properly engage the profit group or even a map indicating location within the community and relative to the group? Okay, I'm guessing that this is a question from uh, somebody who is finding themselves needing to or wanting to uh, engage with Indigenous communities themselves. And this is uh, absolutely something that's uh, important. And, and we um, encourage our clients, for example, many of whom are land developers and planners, to engage with uh, local communities. Um, and we can certainly provide uh, some guidance in that regard. Um, it, 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 it's a little Right now, there's there's not sort of one really comprehensive map uh, that we can point to that can can help you like that uh, with that sort of thing. But um, uh, we absolutely can provide some indication, particularly if you're if you're in the city of Windsor, uh, we can certainly share with you the uh, the groups that we're engaging with. It's a pretty large group, but the main certainly the main communities are. Uh, Caldwell First Nation and Walpole Island First Nation, um, but there are other communities that are signatories to various treaties and whatnot that have interests in the Windsor area, uh, and so we can we can absolutely provide you with uh, that sort of information as well uh, and contact information. Most Indigenous communities have consultation coordinators these days, um, and I know Walpole actually has a just they just launched a, uh, an app. Uh, to facilitate consultation. Um, I don't think it's, I'm not sure if it's up and running yet. Maybe Martin, can you? Uh, yeah, that's me? Caldwell, uh, Caldwell First Nation has yeah. uh, come up with an app uh, to handle uh, the many requests they're getting for a consultation, but uh, I don't believe it's up and running yet. Uh, but uh, most of the uh, First Nations in the area that uh, we're engaging with um, have full-time consultation coordinators, and uh, and in fact, there's a one there's a group of about five First Nations that um, share information on a regular basis. So they're quite well organized and uh, interested in engaging, uh, and especially on this project. So if you'd like to, uh, I suggest that you reach out to us. Uh, via email and we can uh, we can uh, uh, exchange that information with you directly. Okay, um, shall I take the next question? There's a home on Chippewa Street in uh, Sandwich Town. I can provide the address. It was a in a book published in 1909, and in the book it states they're over 100 years old, making it the oldest, second oldest, or at minimum the third oldest house standing in Windsor, surrounded by a bit of land. That would be ripe for archaeology. Could this be something put on the registry at least? Much changes have taken place to the house, but the overall layout is still the same on the outside. Would be great, uh, very late 1790s, early 1800s archaeology if given permission. Uh, this is a great question and, and certainly one, uh, and I think, uh, Sean, you're quite right. Uh, any structure like that is uh, very likely to have important archaeology associated with it. Um, our company does both archaeology and build heritage consulting, and those things often go hand in hand. Um, so uh, you're, you're right on there. Uh, the challenge can be... Um, uh, registering an archaeological site uh, without actually doing some investigation to confirm there's archaeological resources there. Um, but um, we can certainly provide some some guidance on how, you know, what kind of steps might be involved in pursuing something like that. Um, and uh, I, I would suggest that this is a, uh, the sort of question that uh, we would want to consult with the uh, uh, the local architectural uh, conservation 
uh, folks, uh, and it just so happens that the 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 heritage uh, group is is the steering committee for this AMP, so we <laughs> we have a we have a direct connection to them. So, um, if you would like to uh, engage with us directly outside of this chat, that would be great. Uh, we can work with you on finding out some answers to that. Um, but uh, otherwise, we can certainly uh, make some inquiries of our own and uh, look into that possibility. Does anybody else uh, have anything they want to add that's in, in the, any of the other panelists? Christina, this is kind of as the heritage planner. This is <laughs> this is kind of your your bailiwick, I think, too, right? Right. Yeah. So I wanted to speak to this question and thank you for mentioning um, some of the uh, potential um, uh, value in this site. So if yeah, again, if you have um, uh, any leads to any type of uh, site that should be, you think has potential to be recognized by council, then you're more than welcome to uh, contact me and provide me with some of the information. And we're always um, looking out for um, or collecting more information on sites that have, haven't yet been recognized on the Municipal Heritage Register. So um, I'll be glad to take in your information and investigate it further. Thank you. Any other comments from panelists? Okay. Uh, then in that case, I'll take the next question from Don, uh, who asks, the number of known registered archeological sites has increased greatly from 18 in 2005 to 150 in 2021. Were all these additional sites in the areas of high potential? Will the areas of high potential be altered, enlarged as a result of this AMP? So there's, there's kind of two questions there. Um, I don't, I can't answer the first question because we haven't actually uh, compared the location of those sites to the uh, existing potential zones yet. Um, but um, I think that, you know, clearly there's a, there's a high probability that that's the case, uh, but it'll be interesting to find out. But to answer the second part of the question, will the area of high potential be altered or enlarged? Uh, I mean, that's really fundamentally the, uh, the point of the exercise is, is trying to, to refine our understanding of the zone of archaeological potential. And that can go in, in, in either direction. It can go in direction of reducing it because, uh, for example, we may discover that after 20 years that in certain areas that we thought were high potential, we haven't found a single site in, in spite of looking for them in those areas. Or uh, that in fact, uh, in some areas that um, have were considered to have lower potentials, we're finding sites that we weren't expecting to find. And of course, the, the whole integrity question comes into play too. Like, what areas have been uh, developed since then that we can now remove from the potential zone, and so on. So yes, the, the, the really the purpose of the review is to refine and update the zone of potential. Uh, as part of this exercise. So it looks like there's a follow-up question here or two. Uh, will there be a blending of mapping with the two adjoining municipalities as a result of this study? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the archeological management plans are done on, a, uh, uh, on the basis of a municipal boundary, which of course is an artificial construct and, and we actually, when, when we're doing these studies, we actually go beyond uh, in terms of looking at uh, archeological, at least registered archeological sites beyond the municipal boundary, because there may be sites like just across the border that might tell us that, oh gee, you know, there's a, there's a really important site there. It may increase the potential on this side of the line, for example. But we also obviously look at environmental things that are beyond the municipal boundaries. Um, so, but fundamentally, the, the answer to your question depends on uh, the whether or not the adjacent uh, jurisdiction uh, is planning to do an archaeological management plan anytime soon. Um, so, or 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 if they even have one. Um, I mean, Walpole Island has uh, a uh, uh, an archaeological management plan, but I I don't know of any others really in this part of the province. So, um, unless there's one in the works. Um, 
the the mapping uh, there there would be no opportunity to uh, align those those polygons, for example, and make sure that they line up. Um, but um, it's interesting over since we've been doing this since the 1980s, uh, we're getting to a point now where whereas before we had a real patchwork of AMPs, uh, and so it was really difficult to kind of connect them. We're 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 now reaching a point where we've sort of filled in a lot of the holes and we can actually start to do that. Um, so although it hasn't been done yet, and really there's there's nothing really uh, at a provincial level that would be driving that sort of thing. But uh, I guess it's, uh, the only thing I can say is that certainly when we do AMPs, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at anything nearby and, and making sure that uh, it's in some way consistent with what what is just across the line. Um, okay, so this is a question I'm going to throw to. Well, I, I yeah, I I'm going to throw it to the city team because the question is why didn't the city of Windsor consult with indigenous communities regarding the site of the proposed mega hospital? So that's kind of outside the scope of the AMP. So I don't know if you guys uh, have a quick answer for that or or want to take that offline. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. It's yeah, it's Michael Cook. Yeah, I can add into that. Just yeah, it's certainly outside of the the, the scope of the, uh, the the purpose of this this session and something that was subject of uh, <clears throat> an LPAT a few years ago. But uh, one of the one of the outcomes uh, and and we have. Uh, regularly over the last 10 years reached out to first Caldwell First Nations and um, um, also uh, Wapo Island staff to uh, and, and members to just engage with them as best we can. One of the outcomes of this exercise, I think, is to learn from the consultants about how uh, there's a greater awareness of uh, Indigenous uh, rights, uh, whether it's related to, to land and their experiences on the land. Uh, appreciating uh, the history of, of uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities and, and enshrining those policies into the official plan and knowing when, when to consult with them in terms of scale of development and when it may not be necessary if it's something that's um, uh, relatively minor and also in an area of, of low potential. So that, that's part of the process that we'll continue to work with um, uh, as part of this, and, and again, hope to have uh, additional policies in the official plan around uh, um, those those particular items. So, yeah, thanks. I would just add that uh, every municipality in the province is in a similar on a similar track to uh, work with local uh, indigenous communities, particularly treaty holding. Uh, rights holding communities uh, to establish those lines of communication. Um, I, I'll remind you that just it, the change to the provincial policy statement that made this a requirement only came about last year. So uh, it's it's all pretty new. Um, and but many municipalities like Windsor are are really uh, embracing this and and taking taking it very seriously. So. Um, the next question is, where are some examples of the newer sites? Uh, and I'm going to throw this over to Jackie Fisher because you've been doing some work down there fairly recently. There we go. Um, there's a number of sites, um, as expected, they're going to be in the higher potential area. So you're looking at um, a fair number of sites that are coming up along the uh, Detroit River area so that they're, um, and they're, some of them have actually been because of new development in older areas where uh, the archeological integrity has been kept quite high because it was at a point where uh, land development did not do any major clearing of the property. So there's still intact horizons there, even though it looks like it's developed. So that's one thing that we have to take into account is when did uh, the current or what is present development take place and um, where there is still potential left. So we're looking at it um, 
to find out where these new sites are and how they're going to help establish where we, like Rob indicated, where things have been taken out of the integrity or potential because it's been already assessed or disturbed and where are the areas that may still have potential because of the integrity is still intact. So in general, that's, that's it's a little difficult to give specific instances, um, but where they are is generally in the area that you would expect them to be in terms of close to the Detroit River, but there's a fair range of um, different areas. It also depends on if you're looking at Indigenous sites versus colonial period sites and what are the factors that you're looking at in terms of what makes high potential for the, the two separate things. I think that's, I hope that's answered some of that question. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, so here's an, another question from Don, an excellent question. Uh, as part of the study, is anything being done with water archaeological areas? And I guess what you're talking about there is underwater archaeological sites. And uh, it's, it's kind of a yes, no answer. So um, it, we are addressing underwater archaeology to a limited extent. In fact, the one of the representatives from the Heritage Ministry that's on the uh, in our um, uh, technical working group. Andrea Williams is the province's lead on underwater archaeology, so <laughs> she's, she's definitely got her eye on that ball. Um, and we will be making some comment towards that, but uh, this is essentially a land-based uh, archaeology uh, study because it's uh, tied to the Planning Act and, and anything that's triggered under the Planning Act. Uh, which has sort of limited involvement in underwater things. Uh, underwater archaeology is often more captured under processes related to the Environmental Assessment Act, which also triggers archaeological investigation, um, but uh, there's no sort of parallel AMP type process for environmental assessments. They're kind of their own thing. So uh, I hope that addresses that. Uh, the next question from David, areas of potential modeling, as you say, based on past discoveries, geology, et cetera, what is the rate of accuracy? Okay, that's a great question. So potential, uh, archeological potential is one of those interesting things where uh, you you can't say that an archeological site is actually, is you know, a probability, for example, a numerical probability that it's going to be in a particular location. Um, but what you can do is that say that relative to this other kind of area, uh, there's a higher probability or chance uh, that uh, you're going to encounter something in this area versus this other area. It's very difficult to put a numerical value on what that probability would be because there are so many uh, factors that go into why a particular group of people may have uh, occupied that site. And many of the factors that you would need to be able to come up with a numerical probability rate, uh, you just have no control over what, what those are. So it's, it's really a qualitative process. Uh, but I can tell you that um, uh, even, even that said, what we do see uh, is a very good uh, correspondence, uh, correlation between locations of sites uh, and the zones of potential that we model. Uh, one of the most powerful that, uh, criteria that we use for evaluating potential is proximity to water. Uh, because water is the most essential human resource uh, but it's also frequently the mode of transportation. It's uh, an area where game and, and other resources congregate. There, there are just so many reasons why water is an important thing. And one thing that we have done over time is uh, we, we look at, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the, the different uh, distances to water of different archaeological sites. So we can say, for example, in some parts of the province that uh, let's say 80% of archaeological sites are found within 200 meters of a water source. 
that, that's kind of a generic thing, but it's an example and it varies from place to place. Some places, like if you're on the Canadian Shield, you can hardly get away from water, it's just everywhere. Uh, so you have to sort of change your, your parameters there. But in, in Southern Ontario, uh, distance to water has proven to be a very robust uh, indicator of, of um, uh, archeological potential. But again, there you have to understand where the water uh, was and where it was not at various points in time. As I mentioned, the Detroit River was not there for 6,000 years. So uh, that's gonna have an influence on where things are. So I don't know, that's that's kind of a, a convoluted answer to your question. I can't give you kind of a number like 75% accurate or anything like that, but uh, suffice it to say that in the modeling exercise that we do, there's a very robust um, pattern that you can that's you know it's just patently obvious that you're you're capturing stuff and we do evaluate so one of the things we do is we do uh with gis now we can basically lay down a pattern of randomly distributed points on the landscape and then compare that to the known or to the sites that we have to work with and see how those two things line up and again what we find is that whereas uh, we might get like 40% of the uh, randomly distributed points are in the zone of potential, 70% of the, or 75% of the archeological sites are in that zone of potential. So there's there's some uh, attempt at quant, you know, quantitative analysis here, but um, to, to say that it's truly quantitative, uh, I think would be uh, overstating the case, but we, we certainly make efforts to try and get a handle on what the accuracy is like. Okay, the next question also from David, was the past here online EC row site expected or happenstance? Hmm. Jackie, do you know the answer to that question? Um, that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I honestly don't know if it was expected or happenstance, but I mean, it's uh, a pretty interesting site. So, um, it was part of the assessment for EC row. So that would have gone because of the expected route for it. Um, I honestly don't know because that's um, that's before my time, believe it or not. <laughs> I wish I had a, a definitive answer, but it's, no, I don't. Yeah, and it's it's certainly a it's certainly a well known site uh, by name. Um, I'm tr I'm racking my brains. Is that was that a an MTO Paul Lennox project? Yes, it was. Yeah. So yeah. so this was an archaeologist who was working for the Ministry of Transportation, uh, because the Ministry of Transportation does have its own archaeologist, and again, a uh, part of the um, EA process. So uh, and that would have been I'm guessing Jackie sometime in the 80s when that was done. Again, it's kind of um, I'm trying to wreck the brain. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite a long time ago. But uh, -huh. uh they were they were definitely active in the eighties. Uh MTO was doing work. So um but to answer the question of whether they found it accidentally or were they doing a survey, uh we'd have to go back and, and dig out those reports and find out for you. But we can do that if you want. Right. We can uh, you want to follow us up, follow up with us later. David, we can uh, we can get the answer to that question for you fairly easily. Because it was likely uh, because of the Wittenberg site opposite 1935. So uh, Rob, uh, the site was uh, published by Paul Lennox in 1995. So it was probably found and uh, excavated in the early 1990s uh, while he was at MTO. So that it probably was a part of a survey then for the EC row. Yeah, so it was uh, found yeah. during the MTO survey. For yeah, the that makes sense. I was going to say, I mean, any like MTO was not doing archaeology except on projects or areas where they were planning to do work. So that would have been my guess for sure. Um, Sean's asking, do we use LIDAR? So yes, we do use LIDAR. Um, we don't, we haven't yet uh, implemented the use of LIDAR for archeological management plants, but funnily enough, um, 
I've just been uh, talking to our geomatics guy just recently about this question because one of the challenges in Windsor is that there's so little terrain. You know, you're basically on a glacial lake bed there, so it's so flat uh, that the the most subtle changes in terrain can have a pretty significant uh, difference. Now, the challenge, of course, in an urban area is that there's just so much background noise of everything else that's gone on there that uh, trying to tease that out might be uh, a, a real, might be uh, prohibitive, but uh, it's certainly something so that um, that is becoming part of our toolkit. And for those of you that don't know, LIDAR is uh, laser image or laser something detection and ranging. It's basically using a laser, an airborne laser to scan the ground and create an extremely high resolution uh, topographical, uh, essentially a map of the ground, uh, whereby you can you can you know, discern you know things that are just a few centimeters in elevation, um, and thereby give you much greater uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, it's it, it certainly uh, it the. the that absolutely has applications and the data are gradually becoming available for using this on a large scale. Um, so uh, we'll be looking at that, but I, I'm, I can't say for sure if it's gonna be, if we, if we have access to data for Windsor that we can make use of, but we're, we're definitely looking into that possibility. Okay, uh, David's asking, as you likely know, when the city of Toronto did um, underwater cool water city system in Lake Ontario, they found ancient footprints, including a child, but they were destroyed or lost, I believe. Okay, Marty, do you recall this? Do I do remember um, that the, this happened in the early 1900s. Uh, when they were found, uh, uh, while they were doing some work, by I'm not sure if it had to do with uh, with uh, a water system, but they uncovered these footprints, and they were in the newspaper when we did the uh, heritage management plan for the city of Toronto. Um, we uh, reviewed that, and uh, there's a very early. I can uh, I can send you, Dave, the. Uh, uh, the newspaper article about it, uh, but you know, as you say, they uh, they were destroyed, and uh, and no one knows really what happens to them. But uh, most people agree that uh, you know they were authentic and uh, were quite early. Um, but that's about all the information I have <laughs> about it. Yeah, and it makes sense because uh, Lake Ontario, at the time that the first Indigenous people arrived in on, in uh, the Great Lakes area, Lake Ontario was much smaller than it is today, and it it uh, it has grown. Uh, it continues to grow to this day because what's happening is the outlet uh, at the St. Lawrence uh, end is rising gradually over time and basically filling up the whole Ontario basin. So the fact that er, er, very early footprints might exist under uh, underwater uh, or you know in that lake bed, it would have had to have been covered up. It wouldn't be just sitting on the on the, on the you know under the water. But um, that's certainly uh, something that it, it makes some sense. It, it's kind of a, an amazing find when you think about it. I don't think we'll find any of those in Windsor, but. Okay, it's uh, 7.02 and I see there's no more questions. So I, I will, uh, I guess, turn it over to Tracy or Christina. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us in this public engagement session. Um, we look forward to hearing from you through the post session survey. If you have any more information to share or any other comments and questions. For any more information, you are welcome to visit our project webpage on the city's website. And thank you again for joining us and have a lovely rest of the evening.